Chapter 26, Wednesday, October 16, 2002, 1.02 p.m. The sign the man held up said, Walker. Cat spotted him holding up the cardboard with the name written by hand as she walked down the broken escalator in LaGuardia Airport. She arrived by private jet not ten minutes ago. When they landed and came to a stop, she was told over the intercom to exit and go directly to gate 14. Once in the gate, there was a woman who directed her up to the stairs to the main promenade. There were no further instructions, so she went among the crowds towards baggage claim. Her name for the next few days would be Maddie Walker, which Cat found a bit amusing. The flight was very rocky during the approach, and her stomach was a little unsettled. The man with the sign had a black bag, which he handed to Cat. You're staying at the Waldorf. The car is out here. He was thin and handsome in a vanilla way, nondescript, undoubtedly, an agent from some branch of government. He walked fast, and Cat picked up her pace to keep up. Outside the sliding doors was a madhouse. People were smoking, cabs blaring their horns, and whistles blowing. Everyone seemed to be in a frantic hurry. Welcome to New York, she thought. They came to a black sedan double parked with a minibus trying to maneuver around it. The bus driver was swearing, and the sedan's driver ignoring him with sunglasses on in the dark overpass. The agent opened the back door of the car. You have an appointment with Mr. Brogan at three. All the information is in your bag. The pace was too fast for her to think of anything to ask him, although she was sure there would be no answers. She got into the car. He closed the door and quickly walked away after glancing side to side. The driver sped off, cutting off the bus behind him. 2.37 p.m. The lunch went well, Brogan said to Frank over the line as he poured his afternoon tea. Saul will consider his options. Knowing him as I do, we'll get an answer sometime today. He is tied into all the pension managers in the country. There may be more here than we think. Frank made a silent punching motion with the phone held tightly in his hand. He took a second to calm himself before responding, not wanting to sound like a schoolgirl yelling yippee. How was Weinstein? Your Mr. Weinstein is a bit unorthodox, yet very effective. I sat in silence for most of the meal. Once Weinstein and Saul got to talking about derivatives and such, I was lost. He's a very smart guy, but he was a bit intense for Saul's tastes, if I read his body language correctly. Saul was quite taken aback by Mr. Weinstein's findings. This could be a very big opportunity for us. Yeah, lots of hedge funds doing funky stuff. I've been thinking about these large firms, the Merrills and the Lehmans. Perhaps I should contact someone at the Justice Department or the SEC. I guess you can raise the alarm, but I don't think anyone will care. There's too much money to be made. No one wants to take away the punch bowl while the party is rocking. You're right, Frank. A hopeless cause, I'm afraid. Relaxing now, Frank plopped down on his couch. Not hopeless for us. You know everyone. We can get some people into safer investments and make a load of money doing it. Concentrate on the pension funds, the cops, firemen, that kind of thing. Maybe you can appeal to the fiduciary responsibilities that these managers should have. Frank stood up and started pacing, thinking... It wouldn't be good to have Saul Landsman doing all of this. We have set up beards. If Prime Equity starts yanking money out of too many of these hedges, they're going to shut him out. English, please. Sorry, when I was on the trading floor, I worked for a hedge fund as a broker. When we wanted to put on a big position, buy a lot of options, I would use four or five different brokers to put the position on. If I walked into the crowd to buy a large order, the price would go up so fast that it would get out of my range too quickly so I would send in other brokers and maybe try to find some sellers. I'm sure Landsman can figure this out, if he's not working on it already. Any chance he could go around us on this? Yeah, yeah, this is a nice idea. What do you think about me calling Weinstein and trying to hammer something out this afternoon? Frank was shooting out the ideas in his head. Frank, Frank, slow down a little. I don't know how I feel about taking on anyone new, and I'm sure Saul will be honorable in our dealings. Frank ignored what Brogan said about Landsman, figuring from the start that Brogan had his money with him and Landsman wouldn't sacrifice it. You kidding me? I wouldn't hire Weinstein if I was you. He's smart, sure, but he's a little unstable for my tastes. We'll have to pay him some way, but this is a guy you pay a fee, not someone you hire. He's too much of a wacky professor type. Agreed. Talk to him. I'll try to set up an appointment with Saul after he gets back to me. Frank, I like this, but I want you to slow down a little. I know these people. You're entering the world of wealth management. They go to lunch, listen to proposals, and bring them to the board of directors. You could have the greatest idea in the world, but if you choose the wrong cutlery at the Four Seasons, the deal could be lost. Frank didn't mind the rebuke. He knew the trading floor mentality was unlike anywhere else. 
He was used to picking up the phone and shouting, Go! He had a lot to learn and knew it. I'm sure you're right. Why don't we have you take the lead and Weinstein and I will work something out behind the scenes? Frank hoped that he didn't come off as giving orders, so he paused long enough for Brogan to chime in. After a second or two, he continued, Better yet, I'll do the meeting with Landsman. We'll leave Weinstein back at his secret lair. You should see his place, by the way. And you meet with the pension guys when the time comes. By then, we should have the implied backing of prime equities, and the word will be out that Landsman has given his blessing. I wonder what we'll have to kick back to Saul on the deals he doesn't participate in. Brogan started laughing at his end of the line. Frank chuckled at himself, but still had ideas racing through his mind. He couldn't shake the trading floor mentality of sudden action. The stock's moving, hit a bid, take an offer. Brogan sipped his tea as Frank's mind raced. Let's take this one thing at a time, Frank. Meet with Weinstein and try to work out your ideas. Put everything in a proposal for my review. I'm sure I'll hear from Saul later this afternoon. I could tell how excited he was. I'll try to set up a meeting in a week or so. That way, we'll have time to present our ideas properly. Perhaps Saul can advise us on how to compensate Mr. Weinstein fairly. There was a light tapping at Brogan's office door. Hold on, Frank. He pressed the hold button. Yes, Brian? Brian politely stuck his head in. Sorry to disturb you, but your three o'clock meeting has been waiting. Oh, yes. Thank you. I'll be right there. Yes, sir. Brogan got back on the line. I have a meeting in a minute. A favor for a friend at Justice. I can get back to you after the meeting to continue. Not necessary. I'll give Weinstein a ring and see if I can't scare him up. If I'm with him when Saul gets back to you, leave me a message on this phone. My cell is sketchy. How about this? I will call you at six on this number no matter how it goes. Something tells me you may have more ideas by then. Sound good? You're listening to International Radio Tours. Uh, this is your host, Rich Gailhausen, and with us is our guest, John Knuckle, Arthur John Knuckle. You've been listening to dramatic readings from John's second book in his series, uh, the second book, Grit. should mention that uh, uh, those readings were performed by uh, Mr. Mike Payne and by John's daughter, Lindsay Knuckle. Uh, John, we are going to be running out of time here. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we need to get to uh, you know we need to hear from you regarding your websites, uh, your new radio program. Yeah, well, my website to get uh, you know you can purchase my books, read my blogs, uh, see the articles I've had published at Business Insider. Uh, my website is johnknuckleauthor.com. That's J O H N N U C K E L author.com. I'm also very happy to be doing a new radio show, which is called Don't Give Up Your Daydream. That's also where you can find the website for the show, Don't Give Up Your Daydream. Uh, it is, uh, we have uh, the next show coming up, August 11th, I'm really excited about. Uh, a woman named Lois Barth is going to be my guest, and she is one of New York City's premier career counselors and motivational speakers. So that could be a very good uh, show. Uh, she is, uh, you know, the show is about people who are transitioning from one job to another or one station in life to another and how you, if you keep your dream alive, the things that you like to do, if you keep them alive, how that flows through your everyday work, working life. It's it really, it's a fabulous concept and we'll be able to get into more in depth on August 11th. But thank you so much for having me and oh, John, it's a uh, I pleasure. hope to hear from everyone soon. It's a pleasure to have you on our program, John. I want to thank the audience for tuning in to International Radio Tours today. International Radio Tours partners with Storytellers Campfire Radio Programs. Uh, you want to be sure to tune in to John's next program, Don't Give Up Your Daydream, on August 11th. And uh, 
You want to watch for our video release coming up on Saturday, July 25th, after our 8 p.m. show. Oh, that's true, Rich. We should also take a moment to thank the producer of the music, uh, which is Oasis, O-W-A-Y-S-U-S. Not the British supergroup, mm-hmm. but Oasis. All right. Thank you, John. Thanks. Well, now to our listening audience from around the world. This is your host, Rich Gelhausen, wishing you a wonderful day. broadcasting program is managed and directed through Storytellers Campfire Radio. To learn more, visit online at internationalradiotours.org.